Hi, welcome back to session four of Pirates and Smugglers. In the first part of today's session, we've been looking at Pirates of the Caribbean, something we're going to continue doing both today and in the next session. And in the first part, we particularly examined some of the early ventures, uh, the early intrusions of the French Corsairs. We looked at Elizabethan pirates, particularly Drake, of course, in his activities, and also considered the Dutch and their corporate activities uh, under the Dutch West India Company. Then we began looking at another phenomenon, uh, the buccaneers, people who are known particularly because of their development of a migratory society uh, on the island of Tortuga, and how these people became essentially the key players in this process of piracy as it occurred in the mid-17th century. We're talking about the 1650s, 60s, and 70s, and on. And we had ended by looking at Morgan and his attack on Panama, and of course the eye-popping experience of the poor Spanish servant who they managed to get a hold of. And this was not the end of Morgan's career by any stretch of the imagination. However, <laughs> things were changing. We're going to start looking now at a process uh, the beginnings of a process which will ultimately, and I say ultimately because it will take quite a long time, uh, we're getting up to the 1670s. It really isn't until the early decades of the 18th century, the early 1700s, that piracy will actually come to an end. Uh, but we're beginning to see a change of course that's initiated here and will become more powerful as the decades proceed. One of the things that happens just as Morgan is uh, making his career as a pirate uh, and making his raid on Panama is a treaty, the Treaty of Madrid, signed in July 1670. The important part of this treaty for us, uh, other than the fact that it was England and Spain making peace again, which they did and undid any number of times uh, during these centuries, but the important issue here for us in terms of pirates is that the treaty recognized England's possessions in the Caribbean. In other words, now islands like Jamaica and St. Kitts were recognized by the Spanish as legitimate colonial possessions. What does that mean? It means that the Spanish have, uh, the Spanish, the English have a reason for wanting to establish at least some version of reasonable diplomatic relations with the Spanish. In other words, they do not feel the same compulsion to attack the Spanish and use the pirates as a means of fending off Spanish power in the Caribbean because now their own possessions have some legitimacy here. So this is the beginning of a process. It's not overwhelming. It doesn't mean the end to pirate attacks, certainly not over the long term, but it does mean that conditions are starting to change. The English, instead of just being interlopers now, are getting to be established colonialists themselves. And in that environment, as it develops over time, there's going to be less motivation to support piracy. Now, in the short term, this had a p an important impact upon Morgan because his attack had occurred in 1671. Now, the treaty was signed in 1670. Now, quite reasonably, given the speed of communication at this time, uh, it can be argued that, look, he didn't even know about the treaty. But in fact, the governor of Jamaica had told Morgan not to undertake the attack on Panama. He did not want to proceed with the attack. Morgan had gone anyways. And when he gets back, of course, uh, the environment is definitely changing. Now England is looking for ways not to antagonize the Spanish. And what has Morgan done? He's run across the Panama Isthmus and attacked the city of Panama, uh, causing enormous damage to this outpost for the Spanish. And he becomes a target now and will be arrested for piracy, even though in the past that was not the case. Uh, the first indications that things are not going to go that well f for Morgan is the fact that the governor at this time, Thomas Lynch, issues an amnesty for pirates. This was now a new official policy coming from London. The idea was from henceforward, if you have committed acts of piracy prior to this time, uh, you will be forgiven, you can settle down and live as a law-abiding citizen, uh, you will not be 
uh, put on trial, you'll not be executed, drawn, quartered, or whatever else we might normally do to you, uh, you've got a free pass. This was a clear indication from London that they wanted an end to piracy at this point. They did not see a reason for antagonizing the Spanish if the Spanish were ready to recognize their colonies. Meanwhile, Morgan has got caught in the shift between, yes, the local governor giving out commissions for these raids, and now the London government saying, no, that's the end of this. We're not going to turn blind eye. We'll give an amnesty, but any other acts of piracy will be punished. And of course, Morgan had committed his act of piracy uh, even after the treaty was signed and even after he knew that he was being prohibited by the governor from taking on this attack. As a result, Morgan is arrested. He is not going to be included in this grant of leniency uh, because of what he had done. And he is put on trial in London for piracy. However, he wasn't in a lot of danger. In fact, uh, the trial is a bit of a farce, and he's not going to serve any jail time. He's going to be exonerated, if you will, even though he had committed acts of piracy. They had been in defiance of a royal governor's orders. All of that seemed somehow to become irrelevant. In fact, he's going to be going back to Jamaica, and he's going to be appointed the deputy governor. <laughs> so he goes from pirate to criminal on trial to deputy governor, just showing you what a great land of opportunity England was at the time. Uh, the fact is that there's still a good deal of support in the Caribbean and even in England itself for piracy. Because even though, yes, diplomatically, England may want better relations with Spain now that its uh, island possessions have been recognized, uh, the truth is that financially, economically, the pirates are still very important to the maintenance of the Caribbean colonies. When that changes, then policy is going to change dramatically. But at least right now, despite the shift in diplomatic positions, the truth is the islands still need the pirates, and therefore people do not want to totally discourage piracy. <laughs> Otherwise, they wouldn't be sending a former pirate back uh, as the deputy governor of the island. The governor at this time, Lord Carlyle, mm -hmm. Lord Carlyle, is definitely a pirate supporter. He's somebody who's willing to encourage uh, the continuing development of piracy at this time. And therefore, he will issue additional commissions to the pirates to continue their activities. So we return to uh, square one, or it appears that we're back to where we were with earlier governors, and that is to keep the economy rolling, to keep the pirates from abandoning Port Royal, they are going to continue to grant these commissions. <coughs> Oddly enough, however, in the end, there is yet another shift of policy, and once again, England decides that pirates are persona non grata in the Caribbean. Why? In part, again, because of the diplomatic issues, but also because by 1680, the economy is changing. Gradually, sugar plantations are becoming important on many of the British and other European Caribbean islands. The economies are starting to grow. And under those circumstances, the fact is there's not a lot of room for pirates. In fact, pirates will become a problem. Now, again, we're in a transition phase here, and people are still weighing, okay, what's more important? We have this economy that is becoming more stable. There is a basis for wealth above and beyond uh, what pirates may do for us, but is it sufficient at this stage? Can we clamp down on piracy entirely? Well, at this point, 1680, the answer is, yeah, we need to stop piracy again. Temporarily, Morgan finds himself in the position of governor, because there's a vacancy, so he's acting governor, if you will. And he is the one that orders a ban on piracy. So here is the great pirate himself, uh, now serving essentially as acting governor, and he is the one that issues this edict uh, to end piracy. And he actually puts pirates on trial uh, 
it had to be a bit ironic, of course, <laughs> he himself, who had been put on trial for piracy, and of course, because of political considerations, etc., had escaped, uh, is in turn trying many people who he knew fairly well himself uh, as pirates, uh, although the punishments generally are going to be reasonably lenient. Nevertheless, a message is being sent to the pirates that uh, it's time to bring an end to these activities, at least given current conditions. So what will happen is these people will be imprisoned uh, or subject to the lash, etc. Uh, but uh, there are not going to be uh, carrying out of sentences of execution, which was a common punishment for piracy. When the death sentence uh, is widely exercised and used against pirates, uh, it will have a considerable uh, impact uh, upon their activities. Because up until now, of course, pirates, while they faced risk, for the most part, uh, during this era of the buccaneers, with the royal governors supporting these activities, most pirates didn't have to be greatly concerned uh, that they were going to face you know, capital punishment for their crimes. At the most, they might spend a few years in jail, as with these pirates in 1680, if you happen to get caught in one of these policy shifts. And as I said, th the factor that is becoming influential, more influential from this time on, 1680 on, is as the sugar economies start to develop, there are real issues about how long we can go on supporting piracy. It's still an important part of the economy, but it becomes a problem because it creates uncertainty in the economic system. If you've got a number of prosperous planters who are out making money, shipping sugar back to England, etc., the existence of pirates in the Caribbean continues to be a threat to commerce in the region, and it's not always Spanish commerce. I mean, very rarely did these pirates in general always prey on just the so-called enemy. Technically, that's what they were supposed to be doing. Uh, and of course, privateers were specifically designated uh, in their commissions to attack the Spanish. But the fact is, most pirates, sooner or later, uh, would turn on their own, if necessary, if you had to make some money. So the existence, and of course, the British aren't the only pirates in the Caribbean. There are French, there are Dutch pirates, etc. So the ongoing existence of a large number of pirates in the Caribbean is going to create, in the long term, a problem for settlers in Jamaica and other Caribbean island colonies because they want safe passage now, just as the Spanish have wanted it for so long for their silver and gold. Now these people need it for their sugar and for the transport of goods back from Europe. So over time, in the decades from here on in, even though we're going to see, uh, next week we're going to look at another group of Caribbean pirates. This is hardly the end of the pirates. In fact, some of the best known people, uh, like Blackbeard, come from this last episode of piracy in the Caribbean. But in the meantime, uh, there is the beginnings of a shift which are, which is in the end monumental because more and more the local population, which has benefited from piracy and which has supported the pirates and uh, looked favorably upon their commissions, is be going, going to begin to become hostile. And when the pirates no longer have the political protection that they need, their ability to function in such a large scale and with such frequent attacks in one focused area in the Caribbean is going to be undermined. And when that happens, uh, then we'll see the end of piracy. But here we just, the shift has begun. Most people don't recognize quite what's going on. But when we see Henry Morgan putting some of his former compatriots on trial, it's an indication that times are changing. They're not going to change rapidly, but they are changing, and eventually the pirates will not be welcome uh, in the Caribbean any longer. Now, having said that about pirates in general in the Caribbean, we have to look at another element that we've considered elsewhere, because the course isn't just about pirates, it's also about smuggling. And smuggling is a vital part of what goes on in the Caribbean at this time with Spain and its trade empire. First of all, as soon as the Spanish establish their closed system of trade with the New World. They are facing smuggling on a significant scale from all of their European competitors. Uh, I call them here the heretic interlopers. Why? Because all of these powers, uh, the Dutch, the English, and even in France, uh, although France is technically a Catholic country, 
uh, it too has experienced the Reformation, and there is a substantial part of the population that are Protestants known as Huguenots. Uh, and all of these groups that are looked upon as heretics uh, by the Spanish will participate in smuggling activities in the New World. And it's understandable if you look at the existence of the Spanish colonies that there really was no way that Spain could effectively prevent uh, these foreign smugglers from visiting and operating in their empire. Remember, the Spanish idea in terms of dealing with piracy, which is a more violent kind of threat not to their interests, is static local defense. That means yeah, we get our own goods back and forth between Spain and the colonies with the fleet system. We don't send out naval expeditions to wipe out the pirates. We're not going to be involved in that kind of activist defense. We set up a few forts at the key locations like Havana, Veracruz, etc. And other than that, we leave defense to local interests. Now that's in dealing with pirates. The same thing applies to smugglers. If smugglers want to try to sail into Havana Harbor or Veracruz and smuggle goods, they're crazy, okay, because they're obviously going to get caught if they're foreigners. And we'll see about other people later. But if they want to go elsewhere where defenses are far less significant, chances are they're going to be able to succeed because the Spanish don't have the resources to go out looking for them. I mean, there are settlements all along the coasts of Mexico, Peru, etc., where foreigners can move in and trade goods. Now, again, whether you'll make a fortune, you know, you're not tapping into the main economic routes of the empire at this point, but still, smuggling can be carried on. And as we saw with the pirates, as we saw with Hawkins, uh, for these other people who are pretty much pure smugglers, you can always use the threat of force if there is a local Spanish official who resists the smuggling. So almost from the beginning, from the time that a significant Spanish population shows up in the New World, certainly by uh, the 1550s and on, uh, smugglers are there, foreign smugglers are there, and engaged considerably in the trade in the New World. So Spain's idea of a closed monopolistic system uh, was virtually never a reality because Spain simply didn't have the resources to enforce it. It sounds good, uh, looks good on paper that you're focusing all the trade into these few areas. But at the same time, the fact is you can't defend all of those areas. You can't defend the whole coast of South America, the whole coast of Mexico, et cetera. And then there's another factor uh, which contributes to all of this. If you look again, and again, sort of juxtaposing the two maps, that's as close as I think we'll get, to making it look sort of accurate. All right. Consider this for a moment. All these people who live in this part of New Spain are here from north of Mexico City. And all the people that live here in Terra Firma, all the people that live further down uh, in what is modern day Peru, what's called the Vice Royalty of Peru at this time. Uh, uh, I'm going to have to adjust this up a little, but we'll just leave the focus where it is. Uh, here, Buenos Aires, uh, another outpost for the Spanish, what is now constitutes modern day uh, Argentina. For all of these people in all these places, there's only two places that they can get goods from in terms of Spain or Europe, and they can send stuff out of. And again, we go back here, it's either Nombre de Dios or Portobello, depending on what time period, and then Veracruz. <coughs> if you consider this for a moment, you're a colonist in Buenos Aires, and early on, uh, Buenos Aires develops um, a fairly thriving, uh, if basic industry in cow hides because of uh, the cattle that uh, flourish on the plains around uh, Buenos Aires. And you want to be able to export those hides. Well, to do that, uh, you either have to go overland, which is extremely dangerous, or around the southern tip of South America, which is almost equally dangerous, all the way up here, all the way up until you get to Panama. Uh, the stuff has to be shipped that far. Now, the logic of economic logic says, of course, well, why don't you just send the stuff across the Atlantic? Well, then the Spanish government couldn't control the trade routes. So you have to go all that way. Or you're a, a rancher in uh, the upper reaches of the vice royalty of New Spain at this time, and you want to send your products out. It's going to go all the way down to Veracruz, or from Central America all the way up, or all the way down to Panama. 
the map tells us is that there is a total economic illogic in this in terms of the settlers. That what they want to do, of course, is they want to have reasonable access to goods and have a reasonable ability to ship their goods out. For most of them, in these circumstances, given the kind of system that Spain has created, they're neither going to be able to get goods on a regular basis, because the fleets don't always sail. These goods that are coming from Spain, local goods are an entirely different matter, but goods coming from Spain, from Europe in general, and they're not going to be able to regularly and effectively export their goods. The temptation to trade with somebody else, other than within the Spanish system and with Spain, is enormous. I mean, it's almost a given that these people are going to embrace smuggling. And indeed, even though there was great fear of foreigners, and particularly Protestants, I mean, they are heretics, they, and of course the pirates, when you know, English or Dutch or French pirates show up there, at least if they're Huguenots, uh, they don't hesitate to uh, kill people based on religious grounds, you know, to slaughter people because hmm, they're Catholics, they're Papists, etc. So there's a real fear. But on the other hand, economic reality dictates if we're going to survive in many cases, we have to smuggle. So even though Spain has its declared monopoly, even though these people are technically heretics, that there is this enormous antagonism between Protestants and Catholics, the fact is, from the beginning, uh, smuggling will flourish. And its growth depends largely on how rapidly the colonial economies are growing. In other words, how rapidly are they producing goods that can be traded with the smugglers. So even though these people are foreigners, they are considered to be somewhat dangerous, nevertheless, it doesn't take a lot of threat in the end for most settlers in the New World to trade with the smugglers from France, from England, and from the Netherlands. And in fact, at times in these ventures, you discover that uh, when they do arrive at a settlement, that conditions are often desperate. It isn't even a matter of, well, gee, we're going to have to shoot off a few guns, convince them uh, they have to break the monopoly. In many cases, uh, years would go by without the fleet arriving, and therefore goods were not circulating from Europe into some of these settlements, and people were desperate. And they would trade with the devil, if necessary, and many of them considered the English, for example, devils. But nevertheless, it was a matter of desperation, not even a matter of, well, gee, in order to make a profit. So European foreign heretic interlopers are highly successful in smuggling in the New World right from the beginning. That this system, just as the Portuguese system in Asia, uh, operates like a sieve, you know. Uh, and we can ask the question, and we can back to this again and again. Uh, we have this image that I've set up for you of these various trading empires that are created through the centuries, from the Ottomans to the Portuguese, and now we're looking at the Spanish, and that they are these monopolistic systems, and that there's some smuggling going on. But in the case of Spain, and I think this is to a considerable degree true with Portugal, but especially with Spain, we see a system where smuggling, even by foreigners, who are an anathema, who are forbidden to come to the New World, uh, is rampant. So what we may have here, and we'll see more of this in a moment, is, is really a single system, not legitimate authorized trade and smuggling, but two parts of a single system, and that one can't survive without the other. The so-called monopoly can't survive because these settlements wouldn't survive and people would revolt if the smugglers weren't there to alleviate some of the acute inequities in the closed system. And of course, the smugglers don't have a business to do unless the Spanish are creating this monopoly by creating the monopoly in the closed system, creating this enormous demand. So we tend traditionally to look at you know, what is legitimate authorized trade, and not only now, but we'll see it in the 20th century as well. Uh, we tend to look at it and see, well, here is this legitimate system, and then we have this you know, subculture, if you will, this economic subculture of smuggling. But in fact, you may want to look at more as it's two parts of the same system, uh, and they're symbiotic, that the smugglers help the system survive, and the system ensures that the smugglers have a business to do. Now. This isn't all coming from the exterior by any means. In fact, 
Well, numbers on smuggling, you know, the estimates are always that, nothing but gross estimates of how much smuggling was going on and who was doing it. Uh, but it's, it's probably safe to say that most of the smuggling that went on during the age of the Spanish Empire in the New World was being done by Spaniards and that they were the largest source of smuggling, uh, whether it was in Veracruz or Portobello or wherever. Uh, and that logically fits. I mean, they ha may have used Europeans as agents. They had to at some point to get the goods out of the Spanish system. But the fact is, they're the largest perpetrators of smuggling in the system. And again, it makes sense. Who better to smuggle than people who are part of the system? I mean, other Europeans were forbidden to settle in the New World, uh, much less to visit there. Uh, and therefore, the people who had firsthand access to the system, to the goods, uh, were Spaniards. So it's really, if you want, from the Spanish perspective, I say the cancer within, uh, that's from the official Spanish perspective, that this is a, a rot that they have to uh, cut out of their economic body, uh, whether in fact that's what it is. But the fact, from their viewpoint, from the official <coughs> viewpoint, this cancer is really being self-generated. Most of it comes from within, as much as we have these external pirates. Now, the key example we're going to look at is the Portobello Affairs. And we've, I've shown you a couple of times already on the map, so you pretty well know where it is. Uh, Portobello on the Caribbean coast of the Isthmus of Panama. Now, Portobello was essentially a spot on the land. Initially, when Nombre de Dios is the center for exports for South America, uh, Portobello wasn't even settled. And even as it becomes the key center, the fact is the town remained fairly primitive. We're not talking about uh, a major urban center. And this place didn't have a lot of permanent buildings. Uh, it certainly didn't have anything in the way of paved roads. And the population would fluctuate wildly, uh, depending upon when the fleets were coming, depending upon when the bazaar or uh, the time for trade would take place, the fair. There were annual fairs in Portobello, and what the fair meant, not Ferris wheels and cotton candy, uh, but the idea that merchants would come from throughout Spanish South America, uh, bringing their products, and particularly silver, uh, to Portobello to exchange with the merchants that would be coming in the fleet. So this was a massive undertaking uh, where the basic exchanges that drove the imperial system in South America took place. This was the heart, the center of economic activity because this is the key juncture between Spain and its economy and Spain's colonies in South America. So what would happen is that the Silver mines in Peru would send their products and other goods north on what were called treasure trains, really mule trains. Some was shipped by sea, but of course it was considered safer to send it overland. Why? Because you get the pirates. We know what will happen to the Caca Fuego when uh, Drake gets a hold of it. Uh, on land, there really was no serious challenge to Spanish control at this point. It was highly unlikely uh, that. Uh, a treasure train, even with a minimal guard, was going to be attacked by anyone. Uh, you know, it was a, a minor possibility, but a few troops were usually enough to guard it. Those treasure trains would come north with the great riches produced by the mines in Peru, and then the exchanges would take place. Now, the amount of wealth that goes through Portobello at this time uh, is extraordinary. And I've given this figure. This we do have some numbers on. So it's a, well, a lot of it was smuggled, but not all of it. But roughly, economists estimate that they tripled the supply of bullion, meaning silver and gold, in Europe in the 17th century. That's how fantastic the output was. And we can see just this one ship, the Cacafuego, was carrying 26 tons uh, of silver. So this is a central economic activity. There, there probably is no activity going on on an annual basis in South America that's more important than what happens at Portobello. And with the arrival of the fleet, there begins a 
series of weeks, stretching through several months, of intense economic activity. As the Spanish merchants bring in their goods uh, from Spain, and these could include cloths, glass products, hardware, things that were not readily available uh, in the New World uh, to be exchanged for silver. And elaborate efforts were made to control prices, uh, to ensure that uh, exchange did not get out of hand. In other words, that uh, there would not be extreme shortages or oversupplies of silver or the goods coming from Spain itself. So technically, it's, quote, a free market. In other words, you bring your silver, I'll bring my finished goods from Spain, we'll exchange them. But in fact, uh, the government, uh, through the large merchant houses, tries to control prices on both sides of the scale. Why? Because it would be very easy for them to get out of control, given the fact that this only happened uh, once a year, uh, that you could never be sure, well, how big a cargo is going to show up from Spain? What if there's a storm and a number of the ships are lost? Suddenly there's a shortage of materials and the prices of certain goods, uh, textiles, etc., start soaring out of control. So it's technically f you know, free exchange that we're there as merchants trading with each other. But in fact, there is a fair amount of control from the top to prevent anything from going completely awry. Or now, in terms of taxation, one of the other reasons besides simply controlling uh, the trade and assuring a monopoly for Spain, another reason for dealing just through Portobello was the simple fact that taxes could readily be imposed by the Spanish government since all trade was being controlled through Portobello. So it's a much easier, instead of having to worry about you know, 15 locations uh, where goods are being imported or exported, here taxation could be focused in one or two specific locations, Portobello and Veracruz. So this is another reason for concentrating the trade in a few areas. It makes it much easier to control in terms of taxation. Now, one of the taxes, shall we say, one of the automatic taxes, was that all silver was subject to what was called the Royal Fifth. You had to give to the royal government one-fifth of all the silver that you were exporting to Spain. That is a big chunk. When you consider a 20%, essentially a 20% tax uh, on the silver that's being produced, that's an awfully hefty tax. When I mean, you think of sales taxes in the contemporary world, yeah, 7 to 8%, 5%, uh, that's pretty hefty tax. 20% tax right on the silver. Uh, that went off the top to the royal government. So one of the issues immediately becomes, uh, can I avoid the royal fifth? <laughs> can I avoid paying uh, that royal fifth? And we'll see there are certain ways to avoid that. Given these conditions that were created, that this fair is being held once a year, that there is at least the potential for enormous price fluctuations, given the fact that it's not really a free market in the end, it's ultimately controlled by the government. Given the fact that this is a monopolistic system, that it is not offering alternatives for people either importing or exporting goods, all of these factors, plus others that we'll see in a minute or two, encourage an explosive growth in smuggling. And Portobello, from early times, certainly became a key center for smuggling goods. And a variety of methods were found by the people involved to engage in this kind of activity. One of the things that we've seen in the past uh, with the Portuguese was, of course, building ships that had hidden capacity, uh, building a lower deck and then below it providing space. In the case of the Spanish, they had to be even more enterprising because, of course, uh, well, with spices, you can talk about, you know, well, I've got this little bag, you know, the size, about the size of a tobacco bag, and it contains enough spice uh, to at least provide me with an income for a couple of years. On the other hand, silver, as valuable as it was, is a lot heftier. Now, too, yes, it's a, a portable and valuable good, 
uh, but it's not quite you know, as light and valuable as spices were. So you had to make more room. So the Spanish engaged in considerable expansion of their vessels, shall we say, uh, in order to provide holes where they could hide uh, silver being shipped to Spain illegally. So this was a large scale undertaking and was almost customary practice for shipbuilders in Spain when they knew they were building a merchant vessel uh, for the trade in the New World, almost automatically they began building hidden spaces where silver could be hidden uh, because they knew that that was going to be the most likely product that would be brought back. And just as in Portugal, so in the Spanish system, there is a considerable mislabeling of goods. This works on both sides, although most of it is on the incoming trade. Uh, and I say that because it's a little hard to mislabel silver for this reason. If you're bringing goods in uh, and you're bringing textiles in, and we saw this example before, uh, instead of saying, well, these are fine silks, these may be silks that have been brought you know, from Asia uh, across the Mediterranean to Spain. We know what's going on there in the battle in the Mediterranean for trade routes there. These goods have come all this way, and now you're shipping them to the New World to, to uh, feed the appetites of a few wealthy people. Uh, those are going to be extraordinarily expensive. They're going to carry very high prices because of the risk, because of the long distance, the quality, etc. If you put those into a bundle of rags and say, well, what we really have here is some basic uh, textiles that were woven in Spain, they're for you know, making pants, etc., for you know, the common laborers. No problem. You can get through that pretty easily. But trying to mislabel silver, I mean, w what are you going to label it? Uh, it's kind of heavy. Uh, if you put it in a box, you know, uh, and say, well, here is my uh, 50 pounds of stuff I'm exporting. Well, 50 pounds of what? I mean, what do we export besides silver and gold? Uh, the next major export is cowhides. You're going to tell me that you know in this box you got 50 pounds of cowhide? You know, you're very good. You must have a, one of those compacting machines at home. Uh, trash compactors working very well. So it was difficult because there are very few products that are being exported. Most of it's silver, and it's kind of hard to disguise silver. I mean. You know, the other product that starts to grow in importance is sugar. But again, you know, if you put a couple of ingots of silver into uh, a barrel of sugar, yeah, they're, they're taxing it by weight, but they're going to figure out pretty soon that, you know, <laughs> the barrel weighs a lot more than it should if it's just packed with sugar. So the, the mislabeling part of it was mostly on incoming traffic. But it was worth doing again because, of course, uh, this is a situation where you can gain access to silver by selling these products. If you can get them in, with little or no taxation because, of course, they're being taxed as if they were just textiles, you wind up in a highly advantageous situation. So mislabeling was also uh, a common practice, but it was mostly practiced in terms of importing goods into the new world. Now, again, we're going to see, we saw this in Portugal, we'll see it here, we'll see it elsewhere. Another factor that always contributes uh, to smuggling is the fact that sailors are underpaid. As we have seen in background material, a sailor's lot in the 17th century, the 16th century, was not a happy one. Uh, their treatment, whether they were on military vessels and naval vessels, or merchant marine vessels, uh, was ignominious. Uh, they were treated like scum generally, and they were paid poorly if they were paid at all. It was not uncommon uh, for a vessel, a merchant vessel, to go out on a trading venture. The venture proves unsuccessful, and when they get back, uh, the crew finds out, guess what, we're not paying you because <laughs> things didn't work out, so you know, we promised you so much money a day, we're not giving you anything. Uh, another common practice uh, was that, yes, we're paying you some amount of money that seems attractive, but once you're on the vessel, you have to pay for everything that you get, except maybe your food. You need a pair of pants? Okay. We'll get you a pair of pants. We charge you <laughs> 10 times what you'd pay on shore. Um, you want uh, some tobacco to smoke? You want this, that, the other thing, a little bit of rum to have? You're paying, and you're paying an arm and a leg for it. So even if technically you were going to get paid when you get back, they say, well, Gee, it was a great voyage. You were gone for 320 days, and you were in 320 
uh, pesos, but guess what? You spent 410 buying those clothes and that tobacco and that rum. Thanks for the memories. Get out of here. So often they got nothing, even if they were promised it. And when they did get paid, pay was minimal. So not surprisingly, sailors, if they had any choice, went to sea on these voyages to the New World largely so they could smuggle because they knew they were going to get a paid a pittance if they got paid at all and the only way they could really make some money uh, was to try to smuggle goods. So they become active in this trade and of course their major opportunity is in the New World itself in terms of gaining access to silver or gold and being able to ship that back. Again because for them, it would be particularly difficult, given the kinds of products being brought from Spain uh, to Portobello, to smuggle those kinds of goods. It's hard to, you know, you're an individual sailor. Where are you going to stuff, you know, a bag full of silk garments in order to try to sell them in the New World? Much easier to do that on the way back, that you get silver and gold. Some of them have money to purchase it. The other way you do it is you make yourself an agent. In other words, you have someone who's willing to pay you when you get back, who, who's willing to pay for the silver and give you a split of it. A merchant who has the money, because you may not, to actually buy the silver when you're in the New World, you use his money, buy the silver, and then you get a split of what you make when you get it back into Spain. But sailors were commonly engaged in this kind of practice. And again, although there are official rules against it and uh, there were inspections of sailors, etc. Uh, it was virtually impossible for the Spanish authorities to cover all of the vessels coming and going, and therefore this kind of trade, although it was a smaller part of it, was an important element of how uh, smuggling occurred. The next factor, as we've seen elsewhere, and we will see right down into the 20th and 21st century, is bribing officials. Again, we have a situation where government employees are in fact buying their offices. You buy the job that you have. You are the port inspector, you're the customs official in Portobello or back in Spain. You bought the job. Uh, you're not being paid a salary and the way that you are going to make any money out of this position is by being corrupted. <laughs> the idea of taking bribes is simply, um, it's simply an established fact. I mean, as much as people are investigated and people are put on trial and people are punished, bureaucrats, uh, for corruption, the truth is that bribery had to be a part of the system. There had to be ways, not always through bribery, but there had to be ways to supply money, income, to royal officials. Now, as I said, there are other ways to do it depending upon your position. Uh, you might be able to get land grants, uh, influence the government that way, uh, and make a business out of that, position yourself successfully in that fashion. But for people working in the customs area, in the ports, etc., uh, the principal way they could secure an income out of the investment they made in this official position was to accept bribes. So it was fairly routine practice. and not looked upon in most cases, most people would not look upon this as a crime. Uh, in a modern day society, yes, we would consider them, you know, because supposedly this is a highly trained individual who's being paid a substantial wage. Uh, they're engaged in criminal activity if they're accepting bribes for smuggling. But in the world of the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, this was not generally the case. The only time this was looked upon with uh, scorn by people in general was when it became, if you will, simply outrageous in terms of the level of bribe taking that was going on or if the official was arbitrary in what he was doing. In other words, he'll take a bribe from you, but he won't take a bribe from me. You know, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> How am I supposed to do my business? So that kind of arbitrary behavior could get you in trouble because what usually happened was if you were denying uh, opportunities to smuggle to some individuals, they'd turn around and report you to the crown and report who you were allowing to smuggle. Uh, so chances of being condemned or being looked down upon for accepting bribes at this time were pretty limited unless you were absolutely outrageous in your behavior or engaged in arbitrary acceptance of bribes. Another reality for bureaucrats 
that was equally common was, as I have said before, this policy of I obey but I do not comply. This system in Spain, as is the system in Portugal, but Spain in particular, is a highly centralized political system. The king has ultimate authority in the New World. Around him are a group of advisors and assistants who help administer the empire called the Council of the Indies. All of the recommendations for action that come from the New World, and we're talking about, let us say, the municipal government in Mexico City uh, wants to make a major change. This has to go up through various levels of administration, ultimately through the viceroy, who is the leading administrator in that part of the New World, then to Spain, through the Council of the Indies, ultimately up to the king, and then back down. In the meantime, of course, it takes at least two to three months just to get the request across the water, never mind how long it's taken to get it through the bureaucracy in the New World, or how long it'll take to go through the bureaucracy in Spain, and then back down again. As a result, oftentimes requests were acted upon <laughs> in a rather belated manner. And at the same time, it also meant that the king's knowledge of what was going on in the New World uh, was often seriously outdated. And oftentimes, his knowledge of re real conditions in the New World uh, was seriously impaired. And so, the king or queen would at times issue orders or requirements that were out of date. For example, yes, I want to raise taxes in uh, New Spain next year. By the time the edict gets there, uh, the region is in severe economic depression. <coughs> and you're the viceroy, and you're looking at this saying, I'm going to raise taxes in a time like this? People will kill me. <laughs> so <laughs> you write back and say, well, I obey, but I do not comply. I recognize the absolute authority of the crown but I'm, I'm not going to impose the tax at this time, and you'll certainly understand because I'll explain to you how desperate conditions are. The more practical reason for this in our consideration, just as with the pirates and the sort of forced smuggling, was a situation where the pirate looks at, I mean, the local official looks at real conditions and says, look, we're desperately short of goods and materials, and I have to allow the smuggling to go on. Otherwise, the local settlers will be unhappy. That's the case of the interlopers coming into the smaller settlements. But even in places like Portobello, where we're not talking about the fringes, the fact is that at times the fleets didn't show up. And even when they did, there is the reality that this system really can't function in the way that it's designed to function. And local officials have to come to grips with that and have to make adjustments. That if indeed everyone is forced to pay the royal fifth, to pay the taxes that are there, trade is going to start to grind to a halt. And that if there are not some mechanisms for release of this restricted system, that it won't function properly. And as a result, local officials regularly look the other way. Even if they didn't officially admit this, they allowed smuggling to go on knowing that it had to go on for the system to survive. Now, aside from these standard <coughs> procedures that we've seen elsewhere or reasons why smuggling occurs, we also have the mechanisms of smuggling that have to do with transshipment. This occurred particularly for the silver trade from South America back to Spain. Specifically, if you're shipping silver out of Peru to go up to Panama and then back to the New World, you have to pay the Royal Fifth. But if you're shipping it to another colony, and of course there was need for silver because you needed a species, you needed a medium of exchange. There was always a shortage of basic currency. I mean, there was little in the way of common currency. Uh, coinage, etc., was very scarce in the New World. Uh, most people, if you ask them, 
had no money. They didn't have any coins in their pockets or uh, stuffed in pillowcases at home. Uh, a lot of activities, even at the most basic level, were in the form of barter uh, or credit exchanges. That you know, If you were uh, a small farmer, let us say, and needed something, usually went to the local merchant and got credit. You know, that, OK, you'll give me this um, iron tool that I need to use, a uh, plow head or something, and when the crops come in, uh, for that extension of credit, I'll give you a bushel of wheat or something. That's how most of it occurred. So there was need to move currency around because there was a shortage of it. Therefore, you could do that without paying taxes, as long as it was staying within the colonies. So what you do, you're shipping the silver out of Lima and shipping it not to Panama. And on your invoice, you indicate that this is a transshipment, that you're shipping it to Panama for subsequent shipment to, let us say, Central America, you know, to Guatemala in Central America. So no taxes. And what, of course, is actually going to happen is you're going to ship it to Panama, and then somebody is going to get it on a ship for you and send it to Spain or send it to Europe, wherever. So transshipment is a classic way of avoiding trade restrictions and of engaging in smuggling. Uh, you say that it's going to one place, and true, it is going to that destination, but that's not its final destination, uh, and nor is its final destination a legal one. It's going to be sent somewhere where it, which constitutes smuggling. These processes and these conditions together in Portobello, by <coughs> the 18th century, certainly, had reached a stage where at least one official, well, I shouldn't say official, one scholarly estimate of smuggling in Portobello concluded that 85% of the transactions going on in Portobello were smuggling. So it became so bad that in the end, 85% of the goods being exchanged in Portobello were being smuggled. Um, this sometime as we get into, uh, let's say, the mid-1700s. Eventually, uh, the crown's going to respond to that and adjust the system. But in the meantime, uh, the system was continued to exist on paper. But as we can see from these numbers, in reality, as you get into the 18th century, it's almost a fiction because most of the trade is now illegal. And only the formalities of you know, meeting the official requirements are, exist. It's hard to believe that this could happen. But in fact, and we will see this elsewhere in other trades, when uh, England tries to control uh, the trade in tea and the trade in tobacco, you'll get into the same situation, where most of the product coming into the country is actually being smuggled because the official monopoly is so onerous that hardly anybody wants to actually live with it or agrees to live with. Now, how does the government respond to smuggling in general? Well, uh, and of course, smuggling begins uh, as soon as you establish uh, these ports like Nombre de Dios and then Portobello. Uh, how do they react to it? Generally, the way the system works with payment by weight you know, of taxes, there was ample opportunity for smuggling to go on. And the only way the Crown could really make the system effective was to carry out actual inspections. In other words, we're not going to accept the fact that you said, well, this is, I've got 10, 500 bales, uh, you know, 500 pound bales, bales of uh, cotton fabric that I'm importing uh, in Panama. And OK, you'll weigh them to make sure they're 500 pounds and charge the appropriate tax. The only way that you can do anything about smuggling of silks or precious goods of any kind into this area uh, with that system is to actually inspect the products themselves. And this, the Spanish regime periodically undertook uh, with actual inspections of the goods. Now, when you were caught, and of course, any time they did inspections, they caught people because <laughs> inspections were so rare and so many people were smuggling. Uh, there were various penalties to be imposed. Uh, the potential was for both monetary penalties and for 
penalties involving imprisonment, but even death. Uh, the odds of anybody being actually executed, you know, who wasn't a heretic, in other words, not Spaniard, uh, were pretty slim. Um, the possibility was there, but it was highly unlikely. Uh, it would be like saying, well, you know, we're going to start executing uh, people who get more than three speeding tickets, you know, in this country. You know, you're insane, you know, <laughs> executing half the population. Um, so death penalty was rarely imposed, but monetary penalties were imposed. Now, eventually this evolved into what was known as the indulto system, uh, which in effect uh, became a tax on smuggling. The normal procedure would be, well, I say normal, in the contemporary world, you find smuggled goods, you seize the goods, and then the smuggler is penalized, you know, with a prison sentence or a, a fine of some kind, etc. But with the indulto system, what happened was, oh, <laughs> it's all silks in here, not textiles. All right, well, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take the value of these goods and we're going to fine you 25% of what we consider their value or 50% of what we consider their value, whatever. Now, be on your way. Well, would you pay the penalty? You, you still get the goods. <laughs> you're, st you're still smuggling them in. It's just that you've now had to pay a tax. So with this, uh, with the indulto system, uh, Spain is really, uh, if you want, legitimizing smuggling because, uh, I mean, this becomes an institutionalized process by which I understand that even if I'm caught, the worst that can happen to me is, well, maybe... I lose most of the profit that I thought I was going to make on the, the deal. You know, I thought I was going to make a 50% profit. Maybe the indulto is high enough that I lose that profit. But God knows that's not going to be an in inhibition uh, to smuggle, particularly since this is only going to happen occasionally. And the regime is essentially accepting the fact that, look, we can't stop the smuggling. Uh, the one thing we can do is when we find some of it, actually impose a fine. Uh, but it, we're not going to stop the trade itself recognizing the necessity of having the trade go on in the first place. Uh, the other issue was that uh, to go beyond this, and you would say, well, gee, this isn't this crazy, this is insane, you know, to have this closed system, and yet uh, you have a penalty being imposed. It's hardly a penalty at all. It's more like a tax. Uh, the other reality is attempts to become more stringent with greater inspections, more frequent inspections, etc., always led to massive protests in the colonies and even by merchants at home. Uh, the merchants at home who controlled the trade uh, were as uh, committed to smuggling as their counterparts in the New World. So any attempt by the Spanish government to seriously enforce uh, limitations on smuggling at this stage in its history uh, never got very far. There were always energetic officials who would come in and start clearing the decks and cracking down on smuggling and carrying out inspections and imposing uh, large numbers of indultos and trying to put people in prison, uh, they'd get their run for a time. And the Crown itself would do this. It would send officials over with strict orders, you know, that there had been an inspection and they'd discovered all kinds of smuggling in Portobello, so this new official has strict orders. Uh, for example, the captain of the fleet would be given strict orders uh, when he went over to see to it that uh, put an end to smuggling. And what would happen is the uh, merchants in the fair would go crazy and uh, shut down uh, their tents and their trading places. And very quickly, the uh, captain of the fleet would realize that he had to give up this process and then go back to business as usual. So if the system seems illogical, it was simply adjusting to the realities that neither the local settler population nor the merchants uh, could really function within the system unless there was some escape valve, and that was, in fact, smuggling. Looking at the causes of smuggling, they are a common pattern, whether we're looking at Portobello in the 1600s or when we come and look at Hong Kong in the 20th century. Uh, most of these factors are similar. In this case, price disparities. Now, in this case specifically, the price disparities are due to a monopoly. That isn't always the case, but in this case it is. Uh, the Spanish, as the Portuguese before them, have tried to create a monopolistic trading system where only they can sell goods to the New World and the goods from the New World can only be sold in Spain. 
inevitably what this means is that prices of goods being sent to the New World are going to be astronomically high. And at the same time, it means people who are exchanging silver for those goods are going to get less value for their silver because the goods cost so much and because they have to pay the royal fifth. So the monopolistic system creates, in the essence, higher prices for people importing goods and creates lower prices for silver for people exporting that silver. Those price disparities mean people are going to enter both ends of the equation and exploit those disparities. We're going to want to import goods and we can do it more cheaply than if we go through the official system. We want to get silver out of the official system because we know we can get more money for it back in Europe than we ever could in the official system. So price disparities, however they're created, encourage smuggling. In this case, it's the creation of an official monopoly. Lack of a modern bureaucracy. We saw this in more detail when we looked at Portugal, but basically the same conditions pervade in Spain. We have the purchase of official office. We have people who hold official office needing to use it to earn an income. That's what they're expected to do. And by far and away, the easiest method for them to achieve an income out of this official office is by accepting bribes. Thus, we have a system where people automatically are going to take bribes as a given, as a normal part of their official activities. And of course, they look upon these jobs as proprietary, that they own this position. Uh, they do not see themselves as modern bureaucrats might, as holding a position for the common good. And one of the things about modern bureaucracies, and you may not feel that way, if you've you know, gone to try to get your driver's license sometime or pay a tax, and, <laughs> I'm in a line for 12 hours. But most you know, professional bureaucrats see themselves as, yeah, I'm, I do this as a living, but that they're doing more than that, that they serve a larger cause. Okay? I know, when, they, when a guy who's inspecting your, you know, a uh, passport when you're coming into the country decides to open all of your uh, luggage and so forth. And, yeah, I'd like to get this guy by uh, the throat. You know, but in any case, most of these people do feel that they have you know, an, an, a responsibility to the larger system. And they're held accountable in that fashion as well, that they are to be responsible to the state, to the bureaucracy. That is not the way official positions are viewed at this time in Spain. Uh, people who hold those positions see them essentially as a means of making some money. So the idea that they would be uh, selling their activities mm, doesn't have much an effect, nor are people in the larger community aghast at this because this is the standard by which the system functions. So lack of a modern bureaucracy. And then finally, even for responsible officials, and many of these officials were responsible, just because they're accepting bribes doesn't mean that they didn't take their job seriously. Uh, it was just it was part of the job. It was the only way you could make a living. But the other factor is that no matter how honest they might be individually, the truth is the system required this leakage, if you will. It was, as I suggested earlier, a system not a dualistic system of official trade and smuggling, but one system, each part relying upon the other. In the case of the official system, the official system could not efficiently supply, for example, goods from Spain on a regular and price reasonable basis. And as a result, officials in the New World, whether it was small settlements or large port cities like Veracruz, key trading centers like Portobello, had to adjust to that reality. And they had to allow for smuggling so the system would survive. Otherwise, it would have collapsed at some point. So they are adjusting to reality. And we will see this, again, at least I would argue that bureaucrats have changed to a considerable degree uh, these days. They're better trained, and they do have salaries, at least, even though some of them may still take bribes. But even with the arrival of modern bureaucracy, modern bureaucrats are still going to adjust to reality and still say when the state says, well, we can't import you know, any of product X, any sneakers for the next five years, and you're looking around saying, but nobody has any sneakers in the country. Nobody has anything to wear on their feet. You're going to look the other way when they start sneaking sneakers into the country. So too, in 16th century, 17th century Portobello, officials had to do this in order to make the system function. 
to summarize all of this stuff <laughs> for today. Whether we're looking at piracy or smuggling, the key to all of this and why all of this flourishes in the Caribbean, in fact, why we're devoting two sessions rather than one uh, to pirates and smugglers in the Caribbean, is because the closed Spanish system, first of all, made it an ideal target. And closed not only in the sense that it is monopolistic, as we have seen, that all trade is to be limited to Spaniards between the New World and Spain, but closed also in the very physical sense that only two ports in the New World, one in Mexico, one in Panama, are allowed to export goods that are coming all the way from northern Mexico and all the way from southern South America. That means that all of the international trade and the incredibly valuable silver resources that are being exported out of the New World are being funneled out of two ports and specifically through one relatively constricted waterway. When I say relatively constricted, certainly you can sail around the Caribbean. It's not, you know, a canal. But on the other hand, it's not the Atlantic Ocean. It's not the Pacific. There are a number of large islands on it, which can be eventually, as we will see, used for pirate bases. But there are a limited number of possibilities where the ships can move. And therefore, it's an ideal target. It's a monopoly, plus you don't have to look that far to find where the vessels are going to be carrying these goods. Nor do you have to look very far to find out where the key points are uh, to get into the smuggling process at its most remunerative, that is in Veracruz or Portobello. So the physical constrictions, as much as they allow the Spanish to control the system better, also are an invitation to smuggling and especially to piracy because you've concentrated your resources in one or two key places. You don't have to go searching all over the ocean to find a treasure ship to attack. The other factor that I just mentioned is the wealth of the Americans, the silver. I mean, increasing the you know, <coughs> bullion circulation in Europe in the 17th century by a third, uh, this flow of wealth may have been unprecedented in human history. Just how much in the way of economic wealth was extracted from the New World and shipped to Europe. It will have broad and compelling effects upon Europe, help set off price inflation, which I talked about, contribute to the rise of the Industrial Revolution in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. That kind of wealth inevitably was going to attract outsiders to try to insert themselves into the process. It's a little bit like looking at the oil of the Middle East today. You know, that given the concentration of wealth in that area, of this one product, given its value and its limited geographical location, all kinds of superpowers over the years, whether it's been the Soviet Union, the United States, and lesser powers like Iraq, have tried to establish a dominant role in the region because of that value. Britain and France before us, etc. So too, with the wealth of the New World, uh, even more fabulous in its own way in this period in history, it was bound to attract these attacks and encourage smuggling. Another factor uh, that contributes to this, specifically piracy, is this tradition of mixing trade and warfare. Uh, if you look at the, the Hawkins uh, expeditions, the early ones, there's a classic example. I mean, what he's doing is he's engaging in acts of piracy in Africa so he can then take uh, stolen slaves and trade them in the New World. Uh, so where do you stop being a merchant and become a pirate or go from being a pirate to a merchant? Depends. This was a, a long tradition in Europe itself uh, that, as we talked about last time in the Mediterranean, you know, sometimes you're, you know, you've got a merchant vessel and you're trading, but you do have weapons on board, and you may just turn around and attack one of your neighbors who happens to have had a particularly successful uh, commercial voyage. So too, it was hardly surprising that that would be then be extended into the New World with people like Hawkins and later uh, the Dutch Corsairs as well, that they would come and engage in contraband trade by force of arms. It was a logical extension to activities and to a long tradition in Spain. I mean, in Europe. Then particularly the role of the British. And clearly the British uh, comprised the largest number of pirates in the Caribbean at this time. Here we have a state taking advantage of a situation where it 
in fact, is relatively weak compared to Spain initially, although this will change over time, but certainly in the 1500s and even perhaps into the early 1600s, England is relatively weak compared to Spain. How is England to challenge Spain, which it considers a serious threat uh, to its existence, as becomes apparent with the attack of the Spanish Armada on England? How is it to contend with this apparent superpower that has this enormous source of wealth in the New World? Well, you use a weapon of the weak. And in this case, piracy is the weapon of the weak. It is the weapon of the weak state. Just as today, terrorism is often the weapon of a weak state. How does it attack its neighbors <coughs> whom it can't possibly contend with militarily? Use terrorism. In the age of piracy, piracy became a means of attacking your enemy who was militarily superior. You could gain access to their wealth, you could do damage to their empire, and yet at the same time, since these were pirates and not part of a royal navy, you could usually avoid out-and-out -out warfare. The Spanish would hesitate time and again because, of course, they have not been attacked by a formal naval force of England. They are fending off more like mosquito bites in the attacks of these pirates and these privateers. So here was an ideal weapon to use against the Spanish. And here again, we see political motivation. And we see why, in case after case, where piracy flourishes, that politics has a major role to play. On the one hand, for the English government, for Queen Elizabeth, her predecessors, and at least some of her successors, the pirates were a way to go after Spain, to gain some of its wealth, gain a foothold in the Caribbean, and limit the power of Spain itself. And for the pirates, of course, increasingly, as England was able to secure a few footholds in the Caribbean, those Caribbean colonies provided a safe haven for them just as the Barbarossas before them sought the, sought the protection of the Sultan of Tunis and then made their alliance with the Ottoman Sultan, so too the pirates of the Caribbean looked to the British to provide them with protection once the buccaneering age starts to develop and pirates are operating out of bases in the Caribbean. The fact that those bases are now British colonies, sometimes French colonies, etc., but it gives them a haven, a place to be protected in case they are attacked by Spanish forces. Another factor that contributes to the piracy is, particularly in the latter period that we were talking about, uh, in the mid-1600s, is a ready source of pirates, the buccaneers, uh, these people who were cast off from colonial society, uh, who were living outside of the normal bounds of uh, society and political regiments uh, on the island of Tortuga, and to some degree in Jamaica, etc. Here was this group of people who were essentially social outcasts, and now could find an opportunity uh, to advance themselves economically, and in fact, in many ways, uh, become folk heroes of their age in the Caribbean and back in England, uh, and even at times uh, the protected, if unofficial, emissaries of the British crown. So here we had a ready source of recruits for these activities in the age of the buccaneers with these cast-offs uh, who developed a, an informal society in Tortuga and later became the pirate crews and captains of the, 15, of the 1650s, 1660s, and beyond. Now, there is another tradition here that runs parallel to this, and that, of course, is a very different group of pirates, the aristocratic pirates. Okay? Drake in particular, Morgan. And when I say aristocrats, I don't mean they all held titles. Um, Drake would be one exception there, that he did hold um, a noble title, uh, was given one for his activities. But here were people from England who, even if they weren't members of the nobility, had a vested interest in society. They were small-time merchants. Uh, they were captains of ships long before they became pirates. Uh, and they operated, as we will see more clearly in the next couple of weeks, uh, at a different level 
because unlike the democratic environment that we see with many of the buccaneers of uh, crews choosing their captains, et cetera, and divvying up their cargoes, uh, many of these other aristocratic uh, pirates or pirate captains uh, ran a much more rigorous system, much like the crews of uh, the Dutch West India Company, they were subject to payment of a wage, to strict disciplines. So we have two traditions uh, in the Caribbean, both the buccaneers, the more democratic system, and the more extreme version of uh, aristocratic or authoritarian pirate captains such as Drake and others. This environment is encouraged, as I said during the lecture, by the fact that these islands, once they are established as British or other European colonies, have little in the way of economic resources. Piracy is a valuable means of generating support and maintaining the viability of the colonies. This is what helps give local support to the buccaneers in particular. But conditions change. We have the treaty which recognizes, in which Spain recognizes the legitimacy of British colonial possessions in the Caribbean. And more importantly for the long term, by 1680 and on, the growing significance of sugar on islands like Jamaica. That is going to lead to a shift in economic interests over time. More and more colonialists over the decades ahead, or colonists I should say, over the decades ahead in the European colonies in the Caribbean are going to look to sugar for their main source of income. And pirate activity is going to become a bane to their existence because pirates attack not only Spaniards, they attack English, French, Dutch merchant ships. At a certain point, the economic logic is going to dictate that piracy has to go. It's not yet, but couple more decades and there's going to be a growing commitment on the part of the colonial settlements to get rid of piracy because it's damaging their principal economic activity. When that day comes, pirates who are seen as folk heroes of the time and certainly as very direct instruments of state government, whether commissioned by colonial governors or by the crown itself, uh, will become an anathema. And when that day comes, as we will see next time, uh, they will become the target of a massive naval attack upon their interests, and ultimately the pirates of the Caribbean will be swept from the sea. With smuggling, we saw two major things. One, the external challenge from other European smugglers and how these European smugglers could develop a very effective commercial activity with outlying settlements. But we also saw that although the system created these opportunities, that the heretic interlopers, as I call them, had to limit their activities to areas outside the mainstream of trade between Spain and its colonies. The larger problem was from smuggling from within from Spaniards who were directly involved in and controlling the system. And they were driven, as we've seen, by price disparities because of the monopoly, by a bureaucracy that was not modern, where offices were purchased, and by the fact that bureaucrats, no matter how honest, had to accept the reality that the system could only function with some smuggling. Perhaps that is one of the most interesting conclusions in looking at smuggling in this time, is that, as I said earlier, it's really a symbiotic relationship between smuggling and the official system. Each helps keep the other going. Next time, we're going to look at, as I said, some of the most noted figures as pirates in the, Sp in the uh, Spanish Main, you know, people like Blackbeard. But we're also going to look at the forces that we've already hinted at today uh, that will bring them low and at the destruction of piracy in the Caribbean during the 1720s. All of that for next week.